Just a quick announcement from our deacons and from our property chairman. Um, washrooms. The washrooms downstairs against the north wall have been permanently shut down. Um, you're encouraged to come here having used that washroom, but we realize that emergencies happen. So the only washrooms that are available is the one right back here off of the ramp and the two downstairs next to the kitchen. I have never gotten into the pulpit and started a sermon saying something like that. Welcome home. Welcome home to all of you citizens of heaven who are still here on earth. Welcome home to all of the saints that make up the Evangelical Lutheran Church here physically, and welcome home to you who are joining us through the live stream. It's good to be back with you physically in person today. The basis of our sermon message is on Matthew's Gospel, and we're continuing our sermon series entitled How to Be a Christian, and we're on part three, Jesus Calls or God Calls. So just as a way to kind of get your head kind of warmed up and thinking this morning, and I'm sorry uh, for those of you who are here Wednesday night, um, I'm back again, and it's pretty much the same message. So let me ask you this question. Can a murderer be a Christian? Can a traitor, a backstabber, be a Christian? Can an adulterer or adulteress be a Christian? Here's the million dollar question. Can an employee of the Canadian Revenue Agency be a Christian? Oh, well, now some of you are going, Arr. our great property chairman worked for the CRA. See, the reason I ask you this question is to kind of think about Jesus' group of followers. And in your head, in your imagination, you might come up with a list of people that you think should be or would be Jesus would want to have on his list of followers. And you might think that as Jesus was creating his list of followers, he would want to make sure that he included, um, oh, maybe like a Jeff Bezos type, a tycoon type, uh, worth $156 billion U.S. and basically started and I think owns the majority of Amazon. Dot com and dot .ca. I, I think you would probably think that Jesus would want somebody like that as one of his followers, right? You might think that Jesus would want somebody like, oh, Bill Gates, founder of, co-founder of Microsoft. Um, a mega charity type guy g is giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars to causes that are near and dear to his heart. And he can do it um, because he and his wife are worth $108 billion U.S., you might think in your imagination that Jesus would want uh, some silver-tongued public speakers on his follower list, his dream team, right? Or people who are hardworking and patient and persistent and you just can't rattle them no matter what happens, kind of like, oh, moms <laughs> or single parents, right? And if those are the kind of people that you would think that Jesus would want on his dream team of followers, you would be absolutely incorrect. No. Because in real life, Jesus' team of followers included people like Moses, an exiled killer, people like King David, both an adulterer and a murderer. People like Peter, for example. Shoot your mouth off first and think about it second Peter, who was warned three times, don't deny your Savior. You're going to deny me. I'm warning you. Heads up. Be aware of this. And what does he do? He backstabbed the Savior. The Apostle Paul, an accomplice to murder and also a persecutor of Christians. Oh, and don't forget about Matthew, as in our Matthew's Gospel before us this morning. He was an employee of the RRA, the Roman Revenue Agency. So, can these kind of people be on Jesus' dream team, be Christians? Is it possible? You see, there is a message that Jesus wants us to be able to take home for ourselves here this morning, and it's this message about 
this ragtag group of social mit- misfits that supposedly make up his dream team of followers. He wants to erase from our minds, from our perception. He wants to actually, better than erase, like hit delete, delete from our perception. This idea that Jesus' followers have to be some kind of prissy perfect mirrors of himself. Instead, what he wants us to go home with and deeply embed in our hearts and minds this morning so that we take it with us wherever we go, that Jesus came here not to call the righteous, not prissy perfect mirrors of Jesus. He came here to call sinners. He came here to call you and the people that you know. Sinners like, oh, simple Simon. Sinners like doubting Thomas. Sinners like embezzling and betraying Judas. Sinners even like his own teammates, James and John, who were nicknamed the Bornages, um, which translated means sons of thunder. Uh, And we don't really know if that sons of thunder kind of meant that they were like big, burly football types and they were just bigger, larger than life, or if they were kind of like loud and boisterous and they were the kind of personalities that would just explode with impatience whenever people didn't see life and the world the way that they saw it. Sinners like you was on this list. Okay, but you still might be thinking to yourself, why in all the world would Jesus want to choose me? Or why would he want to choose people like me? I mean, I know what I'm like. I can be really lazy. I can be really crabby. I can get really angry and impatient, just like James and John. I, I am a sinner. I can, I'm a cheater. I can be a liar. I can be a biggest doubter in the Christian church, at least that's what I tell myself. In fact, the truth of the matter is that all of us have warts, lots of warts, really big warts. And we think that that would disqualify us from being the kind of polished saints that Jesus would be looking for a building church building type savior would be looking for to be a part of his church right unless unless the chief characteristic that this building church building savior is looking for is not a characteristic in the follower unless the chief characteristic that this church building savior is looking for is something that he actually bestows upon the follower. This thing called mercy. So in two easy steps, how to become a Christian, step one. Step one is you cannot volunteer. And in order to use somewhat of a fresh analogy, um, the truth of the matter is that you and I are kind of like pickled mushrooms. Yeah, I know it seems kind of silly, but it's something new and it's a different way for you to think about it. We are plucked or harvested in darkness and we are processed in darkness and we are preserved in darkness. We're pickled mushrooms. Pretty much. And the problem with that is that darkness only begets, darkness only creates more darkness. Darkness cannot, by definition, generate light. Light needs to penetrate darkness in order to illuminate it so that it knows where it's going. And Jesus, the light of the world, is the one who told us, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And you might be sitting there in the pew or sitting there at home thinking to yourself, yeah, but why would he choose me or people like me to show you mercy so that you could experience 
mercy. There's two really good examples of it. After King David was done committing his ungodly act with Bathsheba and Bathsheba's rightful, lawful husband, murder, what did King David do? Nathan came to him, confronted him with his sin, and he repented. He was crushed. He was devastated. He confessed his sin, and he was just guilt-ridden. And what did Nathan say to him? The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Meaning, David, you're still on the team. That's mercy. Or take the Apostle Peter. Apostle Peter had been warned by Jesus. Three times you are going to deny me before the rooster crows. Check yourself, Peter. Be prepared. Gird your loins. We're going into a rough night. And what did Peter do? He denied his Savior just like clockwork three times before the rooster crowed. He realized what he had done, and he wept. He repented of his sins. Jesus rose from the grave. Peter got to see him, and it appears at that point that in these 40 days of resurrection before he ascended back to heaven, Jesus came and Jesus went, and Jesus came and Jesus went, and there were no marching orders yet. So what, what do the disciples do? There's no Judas to collect funds to be able to feed their bellies, so they all go back to their original vocations before they became Jesus followers in his ministry, and he went back to fishing with his brother. And in Jesus coming and in Jesus going and in Jesus coming and Jesus going, it was a priority for Jesus to go and find Peter while he was fishing and say to him and let him know of Jesus' continued love and forgiveness for Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I do. Go feed my sheep. Peter, do you really love me? Lord, you know I love you. Go and feed my lambs. A third time, Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, then go and feed my sheep. Meaning, Peter, you're still on the team. That's mercy. And Jesus comes to you, and he says, follow me. Follow me, Chris. Follow me, Niasabed. Follow me, Mary. Follow me through everything. For I have you in the palm of my hand. And and your reaction is like either shock and unbelief are overwhelming tears of joy as you croak out of your voice. Me, Lord? You chose me to follow you? You know who I am. I am a sinful man. You know my past. You know the debris that lays behind me up to this point. Lord, you know what I am by nature. And you still come to me and you say, follow me. And we all sit here still asking ourselves that silly question. Why in all the world would the Lord want me? Why would the Lord, why would the Lord choose me? because you need him to. He does not shun you as he should have, or people thought he should have shunned Matthew. He doesn't shun you because of who you are or because of your past or because of who you are by nature. No, he comes to you 
with arms open, with a big embrace like the father and the prodigal son, and he whispers in your ear or he says it eyeball to eyeball or he shouts before he gives you that hug, follow me. And he does all of this in his mercy. And he grants you his forgiveness. And he says, now, my righteousness is your righteousness, and now you are prissy perfect in my Father's eyes. Let me ask you something. When he says then, go and learn what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, how does that change your life going forward? Well, the last 19 years of being here, what, however long it's been, uh, many of you have often or have asked me on multiple occasions, Pastor, what's the difference between grace and mercy? Because you know what? I tell you, I'm not the sharpest tack in the, in the box of tacks, but the outcome sure seems to be the same. You're absolutely right. The outcome is the same between grace and mercy for the Christian. Grace, we would define as receiving something from God that you absolutely do not deserve. Like mercy, like forgiveness, like eternal life in heaven, like the love of a father in heaven, like the, the love of the Holy Spirit living in your heart, like the love of the Spirit of the Christ living inside of you. That's grace. Mercy, on the other hand, is not receiving what you do deserve. <laughs> Eternal separation from your Father in heaven. We'll just use the church word, the Bible word. Hell. Eternity apart from God. You all know, you all know what you deserve because of who you are, because of your past, and because of your very nature. And yet, God the Father sent God the Son to show you mercy. Let me ask you this question then. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Who is better equipped to be able to share the message of mercy of Christ than you? One who has experienced this mercy firsthand. How to be a Christian, part two. Having been shown this mercy, you were called into a life of forgiveness from your heavenly Father because of what Christ has done for you. And when you are called into this life of forgiveness, you are literally called into a life of selflessness. You are called into a life of service to Jesus, a life of service to your fellow Christian, a life of service to your family, to your fellow man. So, I'm just going to tell you that those of you who have J-O-Bs, jobs, <laughs> vocations, careers, you can go ahead and, and quit your job if you want to, if, that's, if you think that's going to help you follow Jesus better. But Jesus makes it really clear in his scriptures that you don't need to quit your job in order to follow him. You can follow him at your job, whether you're jobbing it at home or whether you're jobbing it back at the office socially distancing with or without a mask. You can follow Jesus in the classroom when you get back there. You can follow Jesus in all the places that you hang out, literally and virtually. In fact, by virtue of this call of life into this life of forgiveness, the life, the job of a Christian, following Jesus, that is our job right? The Bible tells us Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Jesus took notice of him. And he took notice of him not as a tax collector whose name was Matthew, but he took notice of him as Matthew, who happened to also be a tax collector. He saw in Matthew a soul, a person who needed God's mercy, 
who needed God's forgiveness and who then would be shown that mercy and forgiveness and then would be given a purpose in life. Follow me, Jesus said. And what did Matthew do? He got up and he followed him. No matter who you are, don't judge a book by its cover because God did not judge your book by your cover. No matter who you are, Jesus wants to reach out to you, embrace you, call you to follow him, show you his mercy, douse you with his forgiveness, and then give you a purpose in life going forward. What's that purpose? You all know if these were non-COVID times, I could say, well, you know, there's always work to do around here at church, except these are COVID times. We don't need as many ushers as we used to have. We could use some volunteers to help Dennis and, and uh, Paul uh, disinfect the pews. That, that would be helpful. But there's, we're not going to have church, we're not going to have coffee fellowship downstairs after church for the foreseeable future. So that service is kind of out, right? Um, But Jesus makes it very clear that the vocation, the life of a Christian who has been called into this life of forgiveness and service, there's a whole lot more to it than just what revolves around within and and on top of the church building, right? Be yourself in the setting in which God has placed you. And if I dare ad lib a thought, to the context of this sermon. There are so many people who think that this COVID-19 pandemic that has hit the world is just the absolutely most devastating, black, dismal, terrible thing to hit the planet. I'm not so sure. Have you clunked your head, Pastor Getzinger? Are you crazy? No, I'm not so sure because God has seen fit to either send it or allow it. And the church has absolutely flourished in its history under pressure and under duress in thin, hard times. Instead of looking this at this as a pandemic, look at this as a unique opportunity at this time in history for the church to be able to carry out her beautiful task of being able to share the message of mercy of Jesus Christ with those in this world who right now are frightened, they are scared, they don't know what's going to happen next. Dare say, I might say, some of them are getting absolutely paranoid. They might be to their doctors needing tranquilizers and medication. Where do they find peace? Where do they find comfort? Where do they find assurance that this world is under control except through you, who has received the gift of mercy firsthand and knows what it's all about? So go out there. Take a look at this COVID life that you are now living as an opportunity for the church to be able to spread the gospel, the mercy, and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Use who you are. Use your humor. Use your love of talking to people. Use your creativity. Take all of that and just offer it to Jesus' ministry and let him figure out how to use that within his ministry in the same way that he figured out how to use the gifts and abilities of a Roman revenue agent in Jesus' ministry by the name of Matthew. A long time ago, and then I followed up about five years ago, there was a survey that was conducted, and the results of the survey was that seven of the top ten most gratifying jobs, careers in the world were jobs like pastors and firefighters. Everyone wants to be a firefighter. Teachers, therapists, top seven out of ten, out of the top ten. And the common denominator between those top seven of the top ten most gratifying jobs in the world, um, the common denominator is that they all helped people. They all served people. 
which means that Jesus must be really gratified at his job because he absolutely loves to help people, serve people, like you, like me, like all sinners who he wants to make saints by showing them his mercy. And then he gives us the opportunity to be able to show our love for him in our service to him, in our service to other people. And what greater gift can you give to another human being in this time of COVID than to point them to the place where love and mercy meet in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you to think about something here. As you're carrying out this service, somewhere in the conversation, you're trying to get to know this person, and maybe the, maybe the question's going to come up. I'm just, I'm just saying, give this a thought. Someone's going to say to you, um, so what do you do for a living? And you know what? I'm going to ask you to pause on going right to the, 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 the real thing. Like, you know, I'm in finance for a big printing company, or I'm retired, or I'm a university professor, or I'm an engineer, or I'm a consultant to the military industry. Why don't you look at them and say, what do I do for a living? Hmm. Well, my boss is a Jewish carpenter who happens to also be the son of God. What do I do for a living? I follow him. Let's go get a cup of coffee, sitting six feet apart. Let me tell you about him. Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. Please all stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, it will guard and it will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.